Hello and welcome. It's all about calibrating fear. Fear because there are so many data points that we are bombarded with as coronavirus increases its grip uh, in, in India. So the what data point do we believe? What is the number that we should be focusing on as lay people and then perhaps as experts or practitioners or people on the front lines of medicine? And what is the number that should perhaps give us some, some relief uh, as opposed to blind panic? To discuss this, I'm joined by Professor and Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, President of the Public Health Foundation of India, also formerly Head of Cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Science and an adjunct Professor of Epidemiology at Harvard. Uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Right. So, as I said, uh, this is all about fear. Uh, one set of numbers can instill blind panic, another set of numbers can give a sense of relief. And that is happening to many of us on an almost daily basis as we try and look at numbers. You know, I was looking at this set of uh, data that has come from the government, from the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare, which says that India's case mortality is amongst the lowest in the world. Uh, our uh, deaths per lakh population against global average is amongst the lowest. So all these are good numbers. Now, on the other hand, uh, you know, when, when you see the uh, newspaper reports about uh, hospital beds uh, going running, I mean, hospitals running out of space, uh, beds getting fully occupied, the reasons might be different, but that instills uh, panic. That gives me a sense that we are actually, uh, particularly in cities like Mumbai, being, uh, we are experiencing a surge beyond something that we can manage. And you yourself have looked at two numbers in a recent article. You've looked at case fatality rate, that's uh, CFR, and you've also looked at deaths per million. So this is the, this is the background to what I'm asking, but the boy, point comes back to how do we manage our, and calibrate our fear? Well, there are a number of figures that are being published, and I admit that this is certainly confusing. But when you look at what's happening in Europe, for example, whether it is Italy or Spain or even the United Kingdom, the number now they are focusing on in order to start relaxing the lockdown is the number of deaths per day. And when they say that for the first time, the number of deaths per day is coming down and it's consistently going down, now we can come out of the lockdown. That is a clear indication that ultimately the objective of the overall response is to try and contain the deaths in the population. And that is fully understandable because we know that this particular virus does kill a fraction of the people infected. And therefore, just knowing the numbers of people infected is not going to be helpful because even on testing widely, we also recognize that there are a number of asymptomatic people could be carrying the virus and may remain asymptomatic and undetected because they're not going to be tested. So given that situation, we do recognize that ultimately the public health objective is to reduce the deaths. As somebody put it, the only thing we can be certain about in life are death and taxes. It appears that taxes one can never be certain. There are a number of people fleeing away, not paying taxes. But death seems to be more certain in any case. We may underestimate the number of deaths because we may not be counting them well, but still the proportion by which these are undercounted will remain generally steady over a period of time. So if we can actually tra track the decline in the rate of death, that will be helpful. Now the question is, do we track it as case fatality rate or do we track it as deaths per million? Now, case fatality rate depends upon the number of cases who are diagnosed and labeled as cases. Now, that depends upon the testing rate. The more tests that you perform, your denominator will keep expanding, and quite often with lower number of uh, very uh, sick patients, because the more people you test, the more mild cases you are likely to capture. Even otherwise, the more tests you do, your denominator increases, and only a fraction of them will end up with deaths that is in the numerator. So if we do widespread testing, we will have a lower case fatality rate. And that is what exactly the United States, uh, Mr. Alex Zazar, the health secretary the other day told Jack Tapper in the CNN interview, oh, we are testing a lot of people, including lots of asymptomatic people, and the number of persons dying of the number of persons tested and found positive is lower than many other countries. Naturally, it will be because you're inflating your denominator by getting a lot of asymptomatic people into the denominator. So the case fatality rate is not a particularly helpful indicator. Then comes the question of 
what are we going to do about the so-called recovery rate? Now, that's a little odd uh, in a statistic because majority of the people will recover. When It depends upon when you are actually tracking from the day of diagnosis. If you have tracked them one month after the day of diagnosis, most of them would have recovered. If you are reporting on the fifth day after diagnosis, then many of them would still be in an active recovery phase. So that's not a particularly helpful statistic unless you are looking at the closed cases and seeing how many have died and how many have recovered. That's a better way of looking at it. So what are we left with? We are left with deaths per million. And why am I taking deaths per million? Because ultimately our response is not only limited to salvaging the cases who have been diagnosed and admitted in the hospital or being isolated at home. Our response is also a response to contain the spread of the epidemic, that more infected regions and infected uh, uninfected people and more uninfected regions are not going to get infected. So deaths per million for the whole population gives you a combined measure of both your containment success as well as your case management success. And if you are seeing that number rising very slowly and your deaths per day or deaths per week, whichever way you want to calculate, coming down, then that means you are able to get a good control of the epidemic. Right. So now in this case, we are only talking about deaths per million in the triggered by coronavirus. We are not talking about deaths per million overall. Yes, we are talking about deaths per million triggered by the coronavirus. Now that comes, uh, that raises the question, if, how are you uh, sure that you're not undercounting? Of course, we could be undercounting, but as I said, if you're actually looking at the trend, that may only create a little noise, but it's not going to ultimately uh, disturb the trend too much. But certainly we want to know how many people died of the coronavirus. And there, it is possible that out of hospital deaths, particularly those who have not been tested, are going to create an artifact. So we need to do what's called a verbal autopsy technique. This has been employed in a number of other conditions where there are out-of-hospital deaths. People go and interview family members or friends or close companions, and then based upon the symptom list, they say, okay, did the person have these symptoms? And now we know there are seven symptoms suggestive of coronavirus infection. We can run through that symptom list, and based on that, we can say, okay, there's a high probability of this person having died of coronavirus. So we can even get an idea of the out of hospital or the undocumented deaths. Uh, but we have to remember that when we are estimating this, we have to remove the road accident deaths. Because during the period of lockdown, the deaths due to road accidents would have come down markedly. So take away, take the total deaths, remove the road accident deaths, and then see whether there has been an increase or a decrease compared to the previous year. That's one way of looking at it. But in order to get a better estimate of the absolute number of deaths, have the certified deaths as well as the verbal autopsy documented deaths. Right. Now, uh, you know, a lot of people are bashing around numbers, for instance, on uh, uh, the, the, the number of days it's taking to, let's say, uh, or uh, the number of days it takes for the infections to increase or double. And uh, within that, we have on the, to on the top line or on the slice, which is, let's say, recovered or uh, on the slice, which is, let's say, admitted to hospitals and in severe to moderate cases. So, so should we then, I mean, does this doubling and so on make any difference eventually, except to understand that how it is spreading? See the uh, well, doubling actually looks at it as an exponential rate of growth and says, okay, is it in how many days is this doubling from the previous number? Now, that is helpful to some extent in understanding how the virus is behaving in terms of its growth pattern. But it doesn't necessarily tell us about how well we are controlling because the more tests you perform, the more the number of cases you are likely to detect and therefore your doubling time actually can shorten. Whereas if you reduce your number of tests, you know, the number of new cases being added is going to be lower. Secondly, also in terms of doubling time, you're adding the old cases, many of whom would have recovered and have actually become closed cases because you're looking at the total count doubling. On the other hand, we may be really interested in finding out how many tests are being performed per day and out of them, how many are actually turning out to be positive? And is that actually decreasing daily, assuming that the testing numbers are standardized and testing criteria are standardized? 
that gives us an idea of active advancement of the epidemic and the response uh, that the epidemic is having to the public health containment measures. But having said that, even the conventional doubling rate with increased testing numbers, if it is actually increasing, that's a positive sign. Right. So, uh, you know, the number that you uh, mentioned is uh, two uh, deaths per million, that is. Now, uh, two questions. One is that figure is obviously no, course, uh, looks good when compared to other countries. And uh, to what extent should we even be comparing with other countries uh, at this point of time? And uh, secondly, what is that two break up? Uh, uh, can, how can it be? Uh, can it can it be unpacked into what is uh, the major cause of disease as we know now looking back and all the deaths that we've seen in the last 60 days? Well, the deaths per million is going to rise week by week because there will be more deaths. The denominator, the population, the total population is going to remain fixed. The question is, is it going to reach the above 300 figure that some of the European countries have reached, the above 250 figure that the United States has reached, or the above three or five figure that some of the Asian countries have reached, or is it going to remain below five? or below 10, that's what we need to see, ultimately. So, compared uh, 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 to... Uh, uh, Dr. Dari, ready, one moment. So, but for cities like Mumbai, it would be much higher, isn't it? Oh, yes, it would be definitely higher. And we are pack, we are taking for the whole of India. You, could, of country, unpack, yeah. you, you could unpack it province by province, certainly. Sure. So, we are taking for whole of India, because the whole idea here is, if you are using it as a tracker, you are also trying to see how well you are succeeding in containing it. If your deaths have not reached a high proportion, let's say in Jharkhand or in uh, Meghalaya and, and Mizora, then at least you're reasonably happy that at this point in time, we are, our containment measures are succeeding apart from our case management methods. So combining both of them gives you an idea of overall how the response has been, not just in terms of case management. Right. Now, if you were to now uh, go one step forward, now, if, if we are saying that we have a, a DPM of deaths per million of two and that will increase, now, how should we be responding when it comes to our public health system? Now, for instance, let's say in Mumbai, uh, obviously, hospitals are crowded and uh, there are not enough people to man the beds, so the number of beds may be enough. Uh, doctors are saying that there are too many people coming to the hospital when they should not be coming. They're saying you stay at home only if you have fever for more than three or four days. You start experiencing breathlessness is when you should come. Otherwise, uh, let the more serious patients come because uh, you're obviously clogging up the system. So knowing the data that you have now and uh, and starting or using this as a starting point, what else can we be doing or should we be doing? Well, I think our public health response in terms of containment has to depend a lot on testing of symptomatic cases and their isolation. If they're mild, they can actually stay at home. If they're more than mild, moderately severe or severe, they should certainly be hospitalized. And now the question, of course, has come in as to how long to keep them hospitalized and whether to test them or not before discharge. Now, the data from South Korea and other places clearly show that once a person is treated and becomes asymptomatic, the chances of their infecting are very, very low, and the viruses that may be found by chance on repeat testing are dead virus. And therefore, that's why the idea is that you may not necessarily want to keep them for too long once they've become asymptomatic. So that reduces the pressure on the hospital beds. But certainly all our containment measures must take into account the need for both home isolation as well as hospital isolation and increase the facilities for both. In the sense that you must actually educate the people how to isolate them at home. And secondly, increase the number of hospital beds as much as possible, as much as needed, particularly in places like Mumbai, where the cases are certainly mounting every day. Right. So uh, I'm just coming back to the uh, Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare document. So they've, they say that amongst active cases requiring critical care, 0.45% uh, only is ventilator, 2.94% uh, is ICU, and 2.94% is uh, oxygen support. So in all, only 6.3% uh, uh, of active cases require critical care. Now, uh, how does this figure look? And is this something that uh, we should also be, let's say, uh, I mean, should we take it as something that we should be uh, comfortable with and or as a source of relief? 
I, I think it's definitely a matter of comfort because when the lockdown started prior to that, there was a huge amount of anxiety, if not panic, as to whether we will have enough intensive care beds, whether we'll have enough ventilators, because the experience was actually being extrapolated to the SARS epidemic, SARS-1, where a lot of people had requirement of ventilators. And here, we also saw what was happening in places like the United States and the UK, where they were running short of ventilators despite being a high-income country. Now, it appears even in those countries, the need for ventilators is now being reviewed because firstly, the pathology is not uniform. It's not always acute respiratory distress syndrome. It appears to be multiple clotting disorders. Secondly, interestingly, it has been observed that even high flow oxygen is adequate and something as simple as proning, that means turning the person onto the belly and letting the person sleep on the belly rather than on the back, itself seems to markedly improve the oxygenation. So we are discovering a lot of things about the management also in this particular case. And therefore, the need for ventilator is now considered to be far less than what it was envisaged to be. Recently, the Director General of ICMR said, just a few days back, that there are only 100 patients now across India on a ventilator. Now, it doesn't mean that we need not have actually arranged for the ventilators because there was an apprehension at that time. But what we really now require is to strengthen our first level and second level health services in primary health care and district hospitals, because that is where most of the case management will have to be done. Right. Uh, you know, if uh, if I were to ask you, I was reading a, a H Howard Business Review, uh, I mean, your cousins, I would imagine, a report by Tarun Khanna and others who said that uh, essentially that, you know, you should be careful about which data to trust. And uh, they said that you should look at transparency, uh, thoughtfulness, which means uh, whether there is regard for privacy while the data is being collected, uh, expertise and open platforms. Uh, this is a Harvard Business Review, so maybe the angle is a little different. So to come back to my original question, uh, Dr. Reddy, so what is the one thing that uh, we should be focusing on now? Well, I would say uh, because there is a lag time between actual occurrence of symptoms and death. What we are talking about deaths today is actually telling us what the situation was about 10 days back or 15 days back in terms of infections. So that is something that we need to look at. But despite that, I would say deaths are the best indicator. Deaths per day are the best indicator for us to find out whether we are actually getting control over the epidemic or not, despite that little lag period. Then deaths per million, as I said, is a better summative indicator of both containment of spread and of improved case management. So these are the things I would be looking at. But I would also be looking at the number of new tests performed each day and the number of new cases detected from those new tests performed each day as a fraction to see whether that rate is coming down or not, because that will be another way of looking at it. Plus, I would also supplement it with syndromic surveillance of household visits by frontline health workers, at least on a weekly basis, to find out influenza-like illness their clinical assessment, and if need be, testing. So there are multiple measures that we need to undertake. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you ask six months later or one year later, how did India do in the whole epidemic, we have to go back to the number of deaths and say that these are the kind of deaths that occurred in India compared to other countries, and we managed to keep it pegged down. Because that is the most certain measure of success that we would have achieved. Right, uh, Dr. Reddy, thank you very much for, uh, as always, sharing your thoughts and uh, hope to be speaking to you soon once again. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you.